Welcome to the Zeke Sky Podcast. guys thank you so much for joining me today on the zeke sky podcast if you like what we're doing give us a rating give us a share subscribe on youtube whatever you want to do i wanted to do this podcast because i think there's a lot of strange polarization that's going on in the politics of today and i think maybe you've noticed i don't get directly so involved in the political environment that's going on right now i like to think about things through first principles so I thought I could do a survey of political philosophy, which is a subject that's close to my heart. And it's something we should embrace and know more about because it allows us to take ourselves outside of our day-to-day existence in America or the United Kingdom and think truly, truly from the bottom up. David Miller, who is a political scientist who's, who's good to follow, he, he basically says that, quote, Political philosophy is philosophical reflection on how best to arrange our collective life our political institutions, and our social practices, end quote. So this is something you really should have done before coming to the table with some kind of argument about why you're going to vote for Donald Trump or Joe Biden or anything like that. So perspective here is very, very useful. The prescription of college-level classes, of which I have took a number of in college, about political philosophy tend to be dichotomized in a sort of modern way. Um, A lot of the political science and political philosophy classes you'll encounter will be titled something like Capitalism and Justice. And when I took that exact class in college, I remember that there were actually only really two books. There were like excerpts from other books, but it it was just two books with the authors who were presupposed to have the most antithetical views to one another. It was John Rawls, a theory of justice, who was kind of like a sort of a communist in a sense, and definitely a a very far liberal guy, and Robert Nozick, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. And that book is basically a giant thought experiment about all the things that would happen if a country like the United States went anarchic overnight. It is a modern work of libertarianism. Some people point to it as sort of being the contents of one pole of the argument, which is that we should have radical self-determination to an extreme point. And it was kind of the exact opposite of Rawls' books. And it talked talk about more about the things that people had rights to. And there'll be surveys of the history of one strand of political thought. For this podcast, I'm just going to go age by age and talk about the thinkers that are important and why we hold some things today as idealism, some things today as being orthogonal to the way we live, some things as just being totally useless when they might have had an application in the past, and things that we think have an application maybe now that in the past really didn't. But... I think it's obviously, here in America, I think the the most important part is obviously to start in ancient Greece. And in ancient Greece, the journey of Western political philosophy really starts to begin and take shape. And it, it really starts with guys like, of course, Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates, but there were long lines of thinking that went back before them, um, and just folk wisdom that sh- sort of pointed out the rights of people, the rights of men specifically. And it's not stuff we, we just have to opine about or, or we that you know we necessarily just think about from reading Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, or Socrates actually didn't write anything, but uh, reading Plato and Aristotle. But um, when we actually look at things like the Iliad and the Odyssey and we look at what the honor culture says, and what the rights of people are, and what the rights of women are, and what the fears are of moral ineptitude, we actually get a pretty keen lens into what the pre-Socratic age of ancient Greece looked like in terms of its ethical and moral philosophy. Things were geared towards city-states, and people thought of themselves in terms of their city-state. This is a decentralized unit of um, politicking that 
really, really emphasizes smaller groups, which partially explains the political and moral ambitions, especially the political ambitions, of an intellectual class in any one of these city-states, Athens in particular. There is the potential for a wider Greek thing that has not yet been realized in you know the permanent sense. They've had tastes of it, and a lot of them probably think that becoming a more unified whole was the solution to existing harmoniously in a world in which there were numerous other civilizations who were considered barbaric. And they will do that experiment. They will run that experiment with Alexander the Great. So Greece is not really considered a united country at all back then. There's just numerous city-states that kind of cover the geographic area of the Western Mediterranean and Asia Minor, and they actually have different rulers, political assets, and societal structures. And while there is a lot of elements in common, and when these places went to war with each other, they kind of did it in like a football-like way, like not too many people are going to use arrows, right? And this is a man-on-man contest. We're going to have rules, right? Because we're all Greeks. It's about as far as it went until you get great unified fires of the Greek world, which come, you know, a little bit further down in history. Now, there was a guy called Thales, um, who was a young man from Miletus in around the 6th century, who sort of wanted to understand the world through the eyes of science. He was one of the first, and he rejected the dominating myths of the creation of the world and of natural phenomena. Um, so he, he, some people think of him as one of the first scientists. Um, His teachings will become famous all over Greece and evoked kind of the first movement of philosophy prior to Aristotle, you know, Socrates, Plato, those guys. And it included other people called Anaximander and Heraclitus, uh, who you will come across reading in science um, about early theories around sort of the nature of Earth. There was one, I'm not sure if it was Anaximander, but it might have been Anaximander, Um, who actually was able to measure the circumference of the Earth based on the two different shadows that were emanating from two places with a known distance from each other. So if you have one that's 60 degrees and one that's 30 degrees, then you or one that's uh, 20 degrees, then you know that 10 degrees represents the physical distance between the two and that um, 360 degrees if the world is round, which some of these guys did know, um, gives you a equation and formula for understanding the circumference of the earth. The philosophers of this time will sort of openly talk about this round, perhaps spherical earth, and they will use it as sort of one of the presupposed facts and something they're trying to tell you about. And a lot of their writing gets lost, which is part of the reason why when they're rediscovered 1900 years later, people on earth are figuring out that the world is round and that you can go to the other places on it without falling off. Think about the grand effect that had on the subsequent history of the world. So these were pretty advanced thinkers in their own right, and they kind of, we call them philosophers because they engaged in basically all sorts of reasoning. They weren't just scientifically oriented. They were concerned about natural philosophy, and they're known as the pre-Socratics. Now, in the 5th century or so, We get the Greek cities, and we get one called Athens, who hopefully we know about. And during that time, the spiritual center of the world was considered to be Athens. People were constantly discussing and using different ideas um, in public baths and feasts. And there there was a lot of communal understanding that philosophy was something to be discussed. And that plays a role in the development of early democracy. And some would say that this is the birthplace of like true institutional science. And um, in that kind of mold, um, a guy called Socrates, who is apparently this broke, ugly guy wandering about, starts pushing people to make very, very distinct remarks about their priors in a conversation, what good is in life, um, you know, how the good is achieved, all of that. And the Socratic dialogues are a sort of... Bible of ancient philosophy, if you will. It lays the framework for what what could be known as Socratic thinking and Socratic questioning, which is kind of like an infinite regress. The sort of intellectual renaissance kind of going on um, in, in this part of the world in Greece. And there, there's a number of reasons for it. People will point at the growth of wealth. Um, Aristotle will actually say, quote, um, in one of his books, 
Uh, he'll say, quote, Proud of their achievements, men pushed further afield after the Persian Wars. They took all knowledge for their province and sought even wider studies, end quote. He's pointing at the fact that after the Persian Wars um, ended, there was less pressure on these Greek city-states, and uh, that the task of philosophy and science became all the more easy to do. Now, at first, the, the philosophy, as I said, was kind of physical. It was around stuff like how, how large the Earth was and what the nature of the stars were. And as I said, the star of this movement was Socrates, and Socrates was known for... You know, I'll tell you from my book, my, um, there's a, um, a book by a guy called Will Durant that I strongly recommend called The Story of Philosophy. And he says this of Socrates, quote, Across 2,300 years, we can yet see his ungainly figure, clad always in the same rumpled tunic, walking leisurely through the agora, undisturbed by the bedlam of politics, buttonholing his prey, gathering the young and the learned about him luring them into the same shady nook of the temple porticos and asking them to define their terms. He sounds a little creepy in that segment, I'm just kind of realizing, but it's also part of the reason why the eventual prosecution of Socrates is something that is seen, you know, depending on your perspective, as either a tragedy for the philosophers of Greece or a miracle for the people of Greece who he had been, some thought were corru he was corrupting. Socrates is kind of trying to get to the very best conclusions he can get to with the most solid definitions on every notion he examined, and he's trying to get other people to do the same. His method of kind of questioning firm ideas that were taken to be as sort of unquestionable got people to try to follow his teachings. And he was sort of a contrarian. He had the appeal of the contrarian, and frankly, a lot of the discussions that Socrates gets into and challenges people on is stuff that we still don't have really good answers about today. We probably don't want to consider Socrates to be the first official political philosopher, but his student Plato probably was. Now, Plato was born in 428 BC to a noble family, and many thinkers before him were concerned with politics and governance, but Pla Plato was very indulged, and he was a very decadent philosopher and his clear opinions and extensive works on the matter testify to it. He says a lot of things about the system of government that are kind of stuff we would recognize um, today, but his most important work is The Republic, and The Republic is a book in which he described his ideal political system, and The Republic will be the main source for a lot of political analysis in ancient history, and up until the present day, I remember in college, this was still something we talked about. It's talked about as a very early version of a communist manifesto sometimes. It depends on who you talk to. There's all sorts of talk uh, in the Republic, uh, you know, a number of things. He, he basically gives you his version of utopia. And a lot of the themes that crop up are things around Socratic dialogues and pointing to the ways in which Socrates thought, which was a lot of what Plato did, is he kind of just wrote down the stuff that Socrates talks about. But they, they talk about a, a class of philosopher kings and of uh, people who are considered part of a, a guardian class, and this guardian class is sort of like a hyper-idealized aristocracy that is specially born and bred to rule. And it's it's maybe based somewhat on observing the Spartan military system. The Spartan military system, if we remember, is based on this weird psych experiment of if you line up all the carrots and six right, can you create a, an especially nasty warrior? Well, and Plato is kind of asking, well, if you line up all the carrots and sticks right, just like they do in Sparta, but let's lay them up right so that we can create a political class that is intelligent and issues proclamations and laws that have virtue in it and can seek the good effectively, can you produce a better society? There are some core features about the Republic, and, and to be honest, the Republic is probably the most important work of political philosophy in the ancient world, and a lot of what I'm about to tell you about the Republic is going to sound very familiar, but I mean, really, in several of the books, uh, it's it separated into a number of books. But um, the idea of justice um, in the individual and the state is kind of introduced as having that co-relationship there. He kind of argues that justice is achieved when each individual performs their proper role in society, right? With the rulers ruling, the guardians protecting, and the producers providing for the needs of the state. It sounds vaguely, when I put it that way, it sounds vaguely like uh, the Karl Marx that will start occurring, you know, 2,000 years after this. Um, 
but basically it also will go over kind of the concept of what you really would call an early communism um just the i everything around the ideal state where property and family are held kind of in common and socrates and you know socrates is the voice of this even though uh plato actually writes this out but he basically argues that this communal lifestyle eliminates selfishness and promotes unity among citizens which is a tough point to refute in a certain context um the emphasis here is as far as socrates is concerned is really around people having a duty to the state before themselves which is obviously a point that's recycled over and over throughout history um then later on in the book uh socrates will discuss the nature or you know really plato mouthing socrates um he will discuss kind of the nature of the philosopher and the importance of philosophical inquiry in the ruling state he kind of says that philosophers have the highest form of knowledge and they would be the rulers of the ideal state and are the best position to execute justice but he also very directly identifies some very i think scary methods for how um you know you should best raise children in the civilization as so as to repopulate the guardian class as it's called and he basically says that the breeding of the guardian's children is precisely calculated and it's basically predetermined by the ruler. So this this class of people that are supposed to be guardians, there's a predetermined number of them. And once these children have been sort of systematically created within the guardian class, they must be properly reared in like a way that stresses community and equality. So he talks about sort of removing all of the pleasures of parenthood from people. He basically says the parents should be, you know, prohibited from raising their own children and even residing in the same vicinity as their children in order to kind of preserve equality and avoid personal possession. And Socrates actually he 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 will say that the the rearing of children is a source of grief is what Socrates essentially says. And it's evaded within this kind of thought experiment, the Republic, through kind of the appointment of officers whose purpose is to take the offspring of the good and bring them into a pen to certain nurses who live apart in like a certain section of the city. And they are raised kind of artificially with very special conditions. It's a social engineering and it is the first mention of this sort of thing in a historical text. Um. Now, when we look at the Republic, it overall, it just presents a, a very old and timeless vision of an ideal state kind of governed by philosopher kings, um, where justice and wisdom and virtue are paramount. It's very idealistic, and it is arguably something that played out in actual life. Some people call Marcus Aurelius, one of the Roman emperors, a philosopher king, as he was almost a philosopher first and foremost, and then became a king later in life. There are things about his rule that are considered especially great in the history of the Roman Empire that can be pointed at. And maybe I'm going a little too far here, but it does seem that in some of the references to Julius Caesar, there is a moment where he leaves to go to Rhodes to study rhetoric and philosophy during the time that Sulla was seeking him out in Rome. It's certainly possible that Caesar considered himself a bit of a philosopher king, and he certainly might have thought this about one of his great inspirations, Alexander the Great. There's an old story, I think it comes from one of the Roman historians, I forget who specifically said that this was true, but Caesar in the the middle of his life when he's in like his 40s goes and sees a statue of Alexander the Great and he goes and he cries in front of it, you know, thinking about how much more successful Alexander the Great was by the time he was, you know, 30. And the funny thing about history is that Caesar actually makes a way more important impact on history than Alexander could have in one way, which is that Caesar actually wrote stuff down, and it comes down to us. It's the Gallic Wars, and the Gallic mm -hmm. Wars is significant just as a general, you know, just a general piece of literature, history, and ethnography, and political science is also very much a part of it. Um, it is the self-told story from his perspective of his campaigns in a place called Gaul, which we would know is like a lot of the area around France today where people called Celts were living. And uh, he tells how, um, you know, uh, 
a very politically science oriented story of how he divides the tribes of Gaul, how he attacks some of them, you know, what the difference in their ethnicities and culture is. And I think it's, it's very valuable as a political philosophy because first of all, it gives us a lot of insight into the dynamics of what was going in that part on in that part of the world, both in Rome and in the places where he's having these encounters with these tribes, including with some Germans. And, uh, as history, it, it gives a lot of detail concerning like the exact military events and the chronologies and the motivations of the people in it. And it's all deals between, you know, him and various thought, first of all, thought leaders within the Celts and in Gaul, uh, a people called the Druids, um, which are, they're like philosophers, but maybe it, there's a lot of respect for them. They're more like wizards. They're, they're like mystic kind of types. And Julius Caesar seems to have a lot of respect for these mystics. and the ethnographic background and cultural habits of the Gallic and the British tribes are mentioned and people, all of it is very invaluable to historians. And while Caesar doesn't present a thesis really about how you govern people like that, he pr provides a lot of perspective to what happens at scale and, you know, on a campaign like that. There are, you know, other political movements that go on that I'm not going to mention here. I'm giving a Western overview. Um, a lot of things are going to be very Western-centric in this part of the podcast and in this podcast. So the next major movement we see in political science and political philosophy really happens in the Middle Ages, we would call it. And let's just kind of briefly review real quick what happens in the Middle Ages. I mean, after the Roman Empire collapses, a state of infrastructural and logistical constipation exists in Europe for a long time. It changes the way people live. It's kind of like if the internet were to go out today. Um, and one of the things that that really, really uh, will lend itself to is movements that, or I would say are movements that have all encompassing worldviews and bring the God, you know, bring, you know, um, your celestial logic into your political logic. And I, I would say the most prominent political philosopher that I certainly read in college from this time that I heard the most from was St. Thomas Aquinas. And you would think of him as sort of a theologian. He, he really is religiously oriented, um, but he believed that kind of political author authority itself is kind of derived from God and that rulers kind of have this moral obligation to govern and promote the common good. So he's kind of, I would say he's specifically an example of a guy who is against the separation of church and state. We can really trace a lot of the theological law origins to St. Thomas Aquinas, even though this stuff um, existed beforehand. You will hear mentions of uh, divinely mandated you know, laws in, in the eyes of the ancients. And we should also remember that even before this, people, pe before this, people were very pious. You know, you would have to sacrifice the right animal at a battle to kind of guarantee the right outcome. And some people probably didn't believe in God, but most people did have some kind of God that they worshipped. There were a lot of polytheistic religions all over the world, especially before the Middle Ages when things really compartmentalize a little bit more. And Christianity is kind of dominating. And the religions of that world were all over the place in terms of what their customs were, the origin story that they believed in, and things kind of really crystallize and become a little bit more uh, central in this time. And St. Thomas Aquinas will believe in what we would, I would say, call is natural law. He kind of says that there's this natural moral order in the universe which you can discover through reason, which is actually very scientific when you think about it. And according to Aquinas, um, if we, we were to listen to him, this natural law is, is universal and it applies to all people, no matter their cultural or religious background. And he will kind of say that it's based on the principles of preserving life, procreation, seeking knowledge, living in society, and worshiping God, which is a very interesting set of priorities for a person to have. That is, you know, if you encapsulate that into today's worldview, that would put you in kind of a very blurry place in terms of our political dichotomies. Um, there is a, there, you can sense there's a scientific orientedness to his writing, but he's being scientific for the sake of pursuing God, not being godly for the sake of pursuing science. Um, and Aquinas kind of favors mixed governments and kind of like combining elements of monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. And 
he kind of he he sees individual rights um as very important and he sees the limits of kind of like political authority he says that rulers should respect the natural rights of individuals such as the right to life liberty and property that happens there and if a ruler kind of acts unjustly or violates natural law, Aquinas believed that individuals have the right to resist or even throw, overthrow such a ruler. Now, I don't want to get sucked down any partisan rabbit holes here, but some there is something that needs to be pointed out here. I mean, it's actually not a coincidence that early Christian thinkers were champions of idealism and rebellion. Let's remember that many Christians went smiling to their deaths when the Roman emperors did not take too fondly to them having a new fancy god that favored peace and that they said that they had made direct contact with. It's only when the Edict of Milan comes forward and you know allows Christianity to function a little bit more that Christians go from being maverick outsiders to at least a little bit, you know, part of the club. So it's no surprise that idealism and revolution are things that early Christian thinkers prioritized. So this is the beginning of what we might see as political idealism, uh, even uh, violent protest. This was something that actually Aquinas believed in, and it, it, he just represents this very interesting lightning rod of ideas, um, That some of which I, I think the modern extremes in our experience would embrace. Um, so it, it's a good period to look at if you're trying to get to the bottom of where a lot of religious idealism comes from, where a lot of kind of maybe even like Puritanism, because you can see that if you throw this into overdrive, you might get a totally Christianized, uh, holy kind of, you know, uh, homogenous version of some kind of uh, religious state. So it's it's worth exploring and understanding. Now, when we move on a little bit, we get a period of time where we would see, we would call this maybe the 20th century, and even before that, there, there, is, there is some stuff in the Renaissance. I could actually talk about that first briefly. Um, but the Renaissance has, as its key figures, um, you know, one guy who's called Machiavelli, which a lot of people are going to know Machiavelli. Machiavelli is, when, when someone says uh, that there's Machiavellianism on a spectrum of kind of like psych behavior, um, and that some people are Machiavellian. This is the guy they're talking about. This is the source of that. And there's a famous book he wrote called The Prince. And The Prince kind of explores the cynical use of power and uh, how you use power to manipulate people. And, you know, the Renaissance in general is kind of a surge of intellectual activity because of the written word as well. This is something that you'll come across as well. People are becoming a little bit more articulate. They're exchanging ideas a little bit more freely and not just purely to survive. Um, but, you know, guys like Machiavelli are one side of the coin. As we get into the Enlightenment, we're talking about guys like John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, and, you know, Rousseau. And they, this is like towards the end of this period, they will really lay the groundwork for modern political thought. Locke is probably the guy that we know best in terms of our day-to-day -day experience today. Locke will kind of have an idea about natural rights and what's called a social contract. And the social contract, uh, I'm trying to think, the, the easiest way of thinking about this is that, um, you know, we think about the government as not being some abstract entity. Think about it as being a person that you have an agreement with, and that person has an agreement with you. That you are going to relinquish certain parts of what is your day-to-day -day natural state of being for the sake of being in a protected ecosystem where you are prioritized. Um, and this is, this is kind of one of the thought experiments here. One of the philosophical paradigms people talk about is the state of nature, right? And that the state of nature for humans is fucking and killing and just all manners of wildness that, you know, um, we are completely unbound in the state of nature. We just do whatever we want and that we couldn't live like that. And there's a presumption there. I will say that that seems like a presumption. It seems like we don't live that way. But the idea that we can't live that way, I actually think is a bridge too far. I don't think that that's what history necessarily supports. It's just that we, a lot of people preferred not to live that way. It is not the case, however, that all people on earth have preferred to live that way. I think you guys might know what I'm talking about, but not all civilizations 
uh, or, you know, not all states even today are civilized. So this is not a conscious choice that people necessarily make. It just seems like once you get the ball rolling in a certain direction, you have certain societies that are going to domineer the course of history and their values sort of make a disproportional imprint on what the political actualization of the time is. You know, so like by the time you've heard about, you know, stuff going on in the 500 BCs and, you know, the Greeks are fighting and they eventually get consolidated and then Julius Caesar goes and, you know, um, brings a whole of Europe basically under the, the, uh, the rule of Rome, you're kind of primed for the part where the Europeans get to the American soil and uh, they encounter, you know, the Native Americans with, you know, who have no sophisticated technology. It's almost like we consider this a matter of course, but things did not have to go this way. A couple things being different in ancient times could have made us way less uh, inclined to be in the civilizations we are today. So it's it's a little bit of confirmation bias and survivor survivor bias. Um, Hobbes is also important. I, I think less important, but Hobbes will um, make a Hobbes will talk a lot about how bad human nature is and how man has to sort of be controlled. And he will talk about that state of nature we were talking about. I actually think Hobbes might have coined the state of nature. It might have been before John Locke, but. Hobbes kind of says that the state of nature is um, something that we had to be transformed from, and Hobbes is the, the guy who famously says that life in the state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, and basically says that individuals are driven by their self-interest to engage in a constant struggle for power and resources, which kind of produces where he would see himself landing in the day that he wrote. And uh, Hobbes kind of says that sovereign authority is absolute, And you you can't, it's indivisible, basically, that the sovereign has the power to make and enforce laws, kind of um, preside over disputes and protect common good. And a a lot of what this will also, from Locke and Hobbes, is they'll both really radically assert that everyone has the ability to practice their own religion. That that is fundamental in how you look at the Enlightenment thinkers. This is, for some reason, something they really, really wanted to preserve. Not saying that it's not important. I think probably the idea around Hobbesian, Hobbesian and Lockean political philosophy, as far as religious religion goes, is that because they've acknowledged human nature to be so bad, it's almost like you're protecting some precious element of human, what they would see as kind of human enlightenment and human enrichment in religion. So that it's interesting to think about that being the source of kind of where we come from in terms of our religious philosophy. I meet a lot of people, I think, who have this view on humanity. And for me personally, I, I think it's, um, it's a strange way to be, to be um, corralled into believing in a supreme deity. That's just my opinion, you know. Well, we get to the 19th century. And uh, the 19th century is marked by a number of political movements. Um, And I I would say maybe the most prominent one that we would know is communism. And communism is kind of fronted by a guy called Karl Marx. And he's a German philosopher. And his political theories are kind of known for literally being the, what we would know is, you know, his namesake, Marxism. And his philosophy and critique kind of revolves around modern civilization and the exploitation of the worker. And this was something that as the factories and the mechanical sophistication of human civilization was becoming more prominent, this was a very good narrative to be delivering to people because there were a lot of people who really resonated with uh, these ideas. And not to say that Marx's ideas don't have the same applications today. But the situation is significantly different in terms of the makeups of populations, which, you know, which percentages of them are living in abject poverty and absolute poverty and absolute wealth and the living conditions we all go through. Now, Marx kind of says that, um, you know, he he's one way to call one way to identify Marx is as a historical materialist which is that this idea that the development of society is kind of driven by the material conditions of production. 
Marx kind of says that throughout history, societies have been characterized by only class struggle, where the ruling class exploits the labor of the working class, which from a number of lenses is on its face true. And uh, if you look at a lot of the economies that existed in the world that he lived in, it was a very practical take. Now, Marx sort of says that com- or sorry, that capitalism, on the other hand, which was still the dominant economic system, by the way, was inherently exploitative. Um, he kind of says that under capitalism, the bourgeoisie or the capitalist class, um, they own the means of production, they control the economy, while the proletariat, or also known as the working class, uh, were forced to sell their labor for wages, and Marx sees this relationship as inherently unequal and oppressive. Now, Capitalism, to Marx, will generate contradictions and crisis that would eventually lead to its downfall. That's what he says um, in, in the late 1800s. And he says that this will eventually lead to a socialist evolution. Marx kind of saw a communist society where class divisions and you know, private ownership of property would be just gone. And in this society, individuals would contribute according to their abilities and receive according to their needs, which is kind of harkens back to the republic um, Marx's ideas, I would say, have a profound impact on political philosophy, no matter where you look, actually. Um, even in political circles that would stay away from the sort of abject indulgence in communist economics, the communist ideal is actually something that religions can recognize from a certain sense of uh, communalism. It's just that Marx wanted to expand the borders of the humanism of religion, right? Where you, you know, the, the sort of compassion that people share for others in their own religion and family. Well, he just wanted to expand that seemingly to the world. That n- not to say that that's what happened, not to say that that's what happened, but that is the the Marxist vision. Um, overall, this critique of capitalism seems to be true. I think that this has to be pointed out. Marx's critique of capitalism is true. The problem is that the solutions that are presented by Marx are, A, as we've seen, they're old. Plato was pushing this stuff 2,000 years before him, and they don't work, it turns out. They're, they don't work as well as a lot of people thought they would work, or they were just applied in extremely bad ways. Whichever your perspective is there, you should understand the root of the idea. Um, and... uh you know, what the advocacy is for a socialist revolution leading to a communist society. Um, And obviously these ideas are still very consequential in shaping our modern lens of global inequality, and they will be increasingly in the future, if you ask me. In the 20th century, and up until the present, there are a number of political philosophers and political scientists who make noise all the time regularly about the events in the world. A lot of things still really revolve around World War I and World War II. We're living, it's easy to forget it, because we haven't seen a world war break out in a long time, but we're living in a post-World War II world. And a lot of the politics in terms of our international situation is defined by the politics of, frankly, fear. Fear is a huge thing in politics. Um, But, I mean, you can think about stuff like real politics. You know, you can think about Henry Kissinger's kind of ideas. You can think about all of the doctrine that have been developed around nuclear weapons, like mutually assured destruction. These are things where you don't necessarily have one author who's coming forward with these ideas. A, A lot of times, it's the politicians who have been the originators of these ideas in the 20th century. Um, But what we're getting now, I think, is in in addition to just a sheer melting pot of political ideas as they've manifested over the eras, we're seeing that the actual baseline restraints that we thought we were bound by are not necessarily true. It doesn't look like the supply curve and the demand curve are going to dictate everything in the future. And a lot of political philosophy these days is going to start ramping up and bringing back stuff like Marx and idealism and, uh, you know, even the Republic, the idea that um, we can sort of provide people with not only the things that they want, but with the lifestyles they want, jobs, and you know, everything around that. And I think as time goes on... um, what we'll see is two trends. One trend is there is this question of the surveillance state. And this is something that 
some philosophers, political philosophers, have talked about. Um, now, guys like Nick Bostrom will sort of who you know he's famous for pushing this kind of simulation theory, where he says that um, you know the works of science fiction and forecasts by serious technologists and you know futurologists predict that enormous amounts of computing power will be available in the future, and then that means we could be part of a, a giant simulation that someone else created. Nick Bostrom also has a rant about uh, turnkey totalitarianism. And turnkey totalitarianism is just his admission, and all, really, frankly, just the obvious fact that if technology continues to produce the results that it's continued, the destructive power that could be held by a single individual will increase. So if you imagine technology going the way it's been going, maybe in 100 years, a five-year-old can build a nuclear bomb in the equivalent of a microwave. That would change the political calculus for the world for the rest of time. You would need a totalitarian state to actually manage that. Now, whether or not this is actually the things, the direction things are going to go in, who knows, but it points to that fundamental change that technology has sort of really, really um, dug in the foundation of what we considered our priors in political philosophy. And I think in the future, we will see more discussion around these sorts of elements. Well, I hope you guys liked the Zeke Sky podcast today. This was a, a really, really fun episode to do. If you liked it, please like, subscribe, leave us a comment, and let us know how we're doing. See you guys later.